January got together to discuss how we could make Central Mass's history more well known. And I thought that maybe we could get a lot of events as one in one place together to amplify that message about what we have here. And with all the people here, we can see how passionate you know, our local area is about our history and science. Uh, I'm also the director of Technicopia, a place of innovation where entrepreneurs and artists and hobbyists come and use shops and tools and get trainings. And uh, we put out some plaques that were made there that show some important Central Mass space facts. Um, so I'm going to pass this on to Kristen Papas, who's here as uh, one of the general managers of the golf course here. And she's going to say a few words, and then we're going to begin with our uh, event. Thank you, Lauren. Welcome, everyone, to Package Our Golf Course. We're elated to have you. I just wanted to um, say that 93 years ago, Robert Goddard launched his first liquid-fuel propelled rocket at the bottom of our rock wall. The site was chosen by his wife, Mrs. Goddard. Also, on July 17, 1929, the rocket crashed, and at that time, that's when Robert Goddard came um, and all the news reporters came. So July 17, 1929 was a big date as well. Uh, we are really excited to have you all. Thank you so much for coming, and I'd like to introduce uh, Eddie Kasanovich, our assistant town manager. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, I just like, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge some public officials that are with us today. Uh, we have a member of the board, Tristan La Liberty, uh, with us, as well as members from the Historic Commission in the Historic Society, uh, as well as Kristen Pappas, our, our recreation director. On behalf of the town of Auburn and our elected officials, welcome to Packachaw Golf Course. 93 years ago on March, in March of 1926, at this very site on the bottom of the hill, Robert Goddard, a Worcester resident and Clark University grad, considered the father of modern rocketry, launched his first liquid fuel rocket. 43 years later, on July 16, 1969, Apollo 11, also a liquid fueled rocket, blasted off from the Kennedy Space Center on America's first attempt to land and walk on the moon's surface. Robert Goddard's rocket was in the air for all of two seconds, reaching an estimated speed of about 60 miles per hour. The rocket is estimated to be about four feet tall based upon some historical photos. In comparison, the Apollo 11 rocket stood about 364 feet and weighing 6.1 million pounds fully loaded. It's mind-boggling to think how that rocket got off the ground. Imagine the thrust it takes to get that rocket airborne. American heroes Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin were aboard Apollo 11, screaming towards the moon at about 25,000 miles per hour. The flight to the moon took four days, uh, with a moon landing at about 8 p.m on July 20th, 1969. As a nine-year-old boy, I watched with much intrigue and excitement. Our entire family watched anxiously the night, as the night grew on. My recollection is that the famous quote of Neil Armstrong, that one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, was heard around the world about 11 p.m. that evening, Eastern Standard Time. And I can tell you that this little nine-year-old boy fell sound asleep on the living room floor. Um, only to hear about it the following morning from my mom and dad and reading it in the uh, Worcester Telegram and Gazette. Back in the day, I had two editions. They had a morning edition and the evening edition. And it made front page news and it was all over the paper. It was a memorable and historic event that captivated every American. And to think it started right here at that site 93 years ago, with Robert Goddard launching his first liquid fuel rocket. And today, there are golf balls flying through the air here on the course. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and please, uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. 
I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Lucy Hale, president of the Ecotarium. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for being here and for hosting us here at this beautiful site. The story of Apollo 11 is really a story of collaboration. The liquid-fueled rocket that Robert Goddard launched was just the start of so much science and exploration that happened, and many of it coming out of central Massachusetts. When I came to this community just about a year ago and had my first meeting with Bill Wallace, the ED of the executive director of the Worcester Historical Museum, uh, he toured me through the museum and talked about Robert Goddard. And I said, you know, the 20th, 20th, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 is coming up on July 20th this year. Is Worcester doing anything? And he said, we have to. And so that led to a collaborative meeting um, with the two of us and Jeff Glick from the Worcester Public Schools. And we really have to credit Jeff for coming up with Worcester on the Moon as the slogan. Uh, he can't be here today, but thank you, Jeff. And that led to a, a further meeting where we invited anybody in the community who wanted to participate. And it was really wonderful to see so many people come together around this idea of celebrating scientific exploration and space science and astronomy, and also celebrating Robert Goddard and his role in all of this and, and Worcester's role in all of this. And I really have to give a huge thanks to Lauren and Technocopia for taking the lead on July 20th and on this wonderful event. Um, it's, it's so incredible when people come together and the power of the cultural organizations in Worcester is so strong and I think everything we've been able to accomplish this week shows that, so thank you. Um, and one of the really special things that we have going on is the ability to see some of the artifacts that relate to Robert Goddard that normally are not on public display that WPI and Clark have in their collections. And many things are on display at the Historical Museum on a regular basis, but this is going to be really special this weekend. And so I'm really excited to introduce Arthur Carlson, who's the Assistant Director of Archives at WPI. Thank you guys so much for participating. So. Thank you, Lucy, and uh, thank you, everyone, for having us here today. Um, as you know, uh, Robert Goddard is, is shared by two of the educational institutions here in Worcester, both Clark University and WPI. Uh, Robert was a, a great fan of WPI. He was actually his class president um, and a reunion captain, so it was a great thing. And we're here to celebrate uh, his innovations today, uh, you know, celebrating the commemorative rocket launch just down the hill here. Um, but you know, innovation didn't stop with Robert Goddard at WPI. Uh, WPI has been integral to the space program for many years. Of course, this weekend marks the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing. And for some of you that may not realize, when the lunar landing module settled down on the moon's surface, it rested on legs designed here in Worcester by another WPI graduate, Alan Glazer, class of 1947. And so every time you look at, up at the moon from all six of those Apollo missions, 24 pieces of Central Massachusetts innovation remain up there because those legs served as the launch platform. So, you know, we can think about that. And so uh, the prototype uh, for one of those legs is actually on display at Worcester Historical Museum uh, this weekend. So you're welcome to come by and see that. But as I mentioned, you know, the innovation didn't stop with Goddard, it didn't stop with Glazer. It continues through today. Uh, WPI still is heavily involved in space exploration and uh, is taking the lead in that. As a matter of fact, uh, just um, next year, uh, we'll actually send up an experiment for uh, non-mechanical uh, cooling pumps. So these are actually pumps that use simulated fluid dynamics to circulate coolant, so uh, to help cool spacecraft as we, um, you know, expand the, the reach of human horizons. So, um, you know, I encourage you, I know WPI is a private institution, but our library is open, and we encourage and, and welcome and invite any of you to come down and visit me. Uh, handle Robert Goddard artifacts, look at them, you know, see all the original materials from Goddard, Glazer, Whitcomb, and many of the innovators that have led to, you know, really guiding central Massachusetts in the spirit of innovation. And to hear more about uh, innovation and uh, Goddard's relationship to Clark University, I hope you'll join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Charles Agosta to the podium here. So. So I'm a uh, physics professor at Clark, 
where, of course, Goddard was also a physics professor. More importantly for me, I'm the son of a rocket scientist. My father built liquid fuel rockets, and he tested them um, while he was a professor at the Graduate Center at the Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn uh, on Long Island. Uh, this is back in the 1960s. So I was present for many of these tests, and it was incredibly exciting. The, the rockets would have a 30-foot flame shooting out of them. The, the ground would shake, and um, it was an incredible noise. And as an eight-year-old, that's really what inspired me to become a scientist. So um, my dad's going to be 96 years old next week. So I'm going down to Long Island um, today, and I'll be uh, uh, hanging out with him to sort of celebrate the landing on the moon, which is a you know, big deal in our family, certainly. So given my childhood, uh, I learned about Robert Goddard uh, before I learned how to play chutes and ladders. So um, when I got a job at Clark University, and I realized that's where Goddard had done his seminal work, on liquid fuel rockets, I was I was really excited. So um, Goddard dreamed as a kid to go to Mars, not the moon. Mars, it's amazing. Um, he had a great interest in science, and his father supported that. Bought him a telescope and a microscope. And when he was in high school, he even uh, bought Robert Goddard a beautiful brass gyroscope. And um, through high school, Goddard played with that gyroscope and sort of tried to figure out its sort of quirky motions um, as it processed and, and, and sort of gyrated and in very interesting angles in its axis. Um, yeah, by the way, I have a huge gyroscope collection in my office just to play with them because they're so cool. Um, the interesting thing about Goddard is years later he invented the technology that allowed us to land on the moon and probably sooner than we think will allow us to land on Mars and um, actually bring a person to the moon and I think probably bring a person to Mars. But also it's important to realize he also created a rocket guidance system based on his playing with this gyroscope, uh, which is extremely important for space flight and space travel and, and rocket flight in general. So I have a couple interesting quotes here. Um, famously, he wasn't well funded in his early days of research and the uh, general public kind of considered him crazy. The New York Times ridiculed him in January 1920 uh, in an editorial um, because he expected a rocket engine to work in the vacuum of space. They called him, I quote, that Professor Goddard with his chair at Clark College, of course it's Clark University, and they went on, um, of course he only seems to lack the knowledge ladled out daily in high schools. On July 17, 1969, the day after the Apollo 11 was launched, the New York Times wrote an apologetic editorial. Further investigation and experimentation have confirmed the findings of Isaac Newton in the 17th century. Blah, 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 blah. The Times regrets the era. So uh, a couple days before Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, the time did correct its, its era. So Robert Goddard had the curiosity and drive to follow his dreams. No one was seriously thinking of going to the moon when he was born in 1882, and let alone in 1926 when he launched his rocket here in Auburn. He taught us some of the most important elements of science, such as vision and making mistakes. His first launch, as we just heard, was trivial in retrospect. The rocket only rose 41 feet. And it seemed a small success after a number of failures of rockets that didn't even leave the launch pad. He understood the significance of his experiments. 
and he pushed on. He taught us also about creativity. His playful games with a gyroscope as a kid turned into patents and rocket guidance systems. Goddard showed us that having the courage and creativity to follow your dreams is how great science is done. This is also how you change the world. We are so proud at Clark University to have Robert Goddard as one of our inspirational legacies. We are also lucky to have hundreds of artifacts from Goddard's life in the archives so we can continue to learn from him. Among other things, lab books, diaries, patents, and his gyroscope, which I've actually held, which was a pretty amazing feeling to have held that. We have a signed autobiography of Goddard brought to the moon by Buzz Aldrin. The book was given to Buzz by Ed Aldrin, his father, who was a student of Goddard's. It's an amazing coincidence. I don't think it's necessarily a complete coincidence. In a way, Robert Goddard's greatest achievements are embodied in Clark University's motto, challenge convention, change the world. Thank you. And now, I would like to introduce Bill Wallace, who is the executive director to the Worcester Historical Museum. Thank you. Um, and interestingly, you, some of you might know that that little biography of Robert Goddard was published in Worcester, Massachusetts by Archie St. Ange. So it has yet another association um, with, uh, with Worcester. It's my pleasure to be here today because this is a, truly about partnerships and I want to thank Clark and WPI for loaning things to Worcester Historical Museum for Saturday and for Lauren and her team and all of our partners in, in pulling together today's event and what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, my job is to offer a little historical perspective so I've prepared a 30 minute lecture for you on, on no I'm just kidding, on what happened here on um, in July, I'm sorry, March of 1926. I thought it would be important to hear some of the things that were written about that day. And one of them comes from a book, This High Man by Milton Lehman, with a, with a preface by Charles Lindbergh, who was one of the people who got Goddard some of his support for his rocketry experiments. So let me quote a little bit and I might skip around. March 16, 1926 was, was a clear, cold day in Worcester, just like today, uh, with snow on the ground, and no promise of spring in the sharp morning air. It was a Tuesday, the professor's free day, with no classes scheduled when he met Harry, Henry Sachs, his new machinist, in the Clark Physics Lab. The physicist carefully locked the door of the shop and climbed into his coupe beside Sachs. Goddard always preferred coupes, quote, you don't have to take an excess of people, he said. Between them, there were two fresh liters of liquid oxygen. There was no guarantee of more from Lind Air Products for several months. So if their March flight failed, it would be April at least before they could try again. The professor was bundled against the Massachusetts chill thanks to Esther's concern for his health. In cold months, he wore high buckled galoshes, a gray coat buttoned up to his neck, a muffler, and a woolen cap. I had that costume ready this morning, but I changed my mind. Parking at a ravine some distance from the farmhouse, Goddard and Sachs carried, slid, and eased the wooden crates containing tools and the rocket's motor, tanks, and piping to a secluded spot near a cabbage patch. They erected a pipe launching frame, and those pipe pieces came from Waite Hardware in Worcester, which some of us know in this later incarnation as Elwood Adams. They erected a pipe launching frame and carefully placed the fragile rocket inside of it. The two men worked through a cold morning hours rigging their gear. Shortly after noon, the rocket was ready. Percy Roop, Clark's assistant professor of physics, arrived at the Ward farm with Mrs. Goddard. She had her husband's latest purchase slung over her shoulder, a French sept motion picture camera, so named because it ran for exactly seven seconds, gentlemen, without rewinding. On many occasions, she had chatted briefly with Aunt Effie in her warm, com commodious kitchen. Aunt Effie was not Robert Goddard's aunt. She was a New England aunt, which meant she was a friend of the family. With Aunt Effie in her warm, commodious kitchen and its familiar window box of bright geraniums. Miss Ward, never quite sure about rockets, once again offered Esther and her fellow adventurers a cup of hot, malted milk as her specific against the chills. We don't need them today. 
There was no intricate electrical system to ignite the rocket motor. When black smoke issued from the igniter, Sachs turned the valve and lighted an alcohol stove beneath the motor. Goddard waited for 90 seconds, then released the rocket. He and Rube edged behind a sheet iron barricade. Sachs ran toward them. The rocket roared off as oxygen and gasoline combusted. Esther's camera unfortunately ran out down in the preliminary moments of the launching, so there is no motion picture of the actual flight. And interestingly, here's what Goddard writes. It, the, the author continues, the maiden flight of the liquid-propelled rocket received brief notice in Goddard's diary. March 16th, went to Auburn with S, Sachs, in AM, E, Esther and Mr. Roop came out about one, tried rocket at 2.30, it rose 41 feet and went 184 feet in 2.5 seconds after the lower half of the nozzle had burned off, brought materials to lab. That's his total excitement. It gets a little bit better the next day. It must have settled in, the success of it, like it will tomorrow as we're all parading around Worcester. March 17, 1926, the first flight with a rocket using liquid propellants was made yesterday at Aunt Effie's farm in Auburn. Even though the release was pulled, the rocket did not rise at first, but the flame came out and there was a steady roar. These are Goddard's words. After a number of seconds it rose, slowly it cleared the frame, and then at express train speed, curving over to the left and striking the snow and ice, still going at a rapid rate. It looked also almost magical as it rose, he wrote, without an appreci any appreciably greater noise or flame as if said, quote, I've been here long enough, I think I'll go somewhere else, if you don't mind. His comment about the rocket. Esther later writes that she remembers God himself saying, I think I'll get the hell out of here. Um, <laughs> Esther said that it looked like a fairy or an aesthetic dancer as it started off. The sky was clear for the most part, with large shadowy clouds, well, we're short of those today, but by late afternoon there was a large pink cloud in the, in the west over the sun shone. One of the most surprising things was the absence of smoke, the lack of a very loud roar, and the smallness of the flame. Goddard would write to, to Dr. Abbott at the Smithsonian, who is his facilitator for some of the money for, to do this, and say he had launched the first, su successfully launched the first liquid fueled rocket. Abbott would write back and say, yeah, but it wasn't a, such a particularly big deal, guys, so you better keep trying. But. Abbott did write to him as a first flight, and this is a quote, it compared favorably with the Wright's first airplane flight, however, and the event as demonstrating the liquid propelled rocket was just as significant. That's the director of the Smithsonian. As a first flight, it compared favorably with the Wright's first airplane flight, however, and the event as demonstrating the first liquid fueled rocket was just as significant. It was Aunt Effie's nephew, Asa, who, um, described Goddard's attempt to launch a, uh, a rocket with what he was called New England cussedness. Those of us who are New Englanders wouldn't know anything about that, of course. Asa Ward said, quote, Bob Goddard was the most stubborn fellow I ever knew. Once I asked him about his moon rocket, Asa, he told me, I'm just trying to get this thing off the ground. And Esther wrote later, looking back, it was the most beautiful sight in the world, seeing the rocket take off. We slogged jubilantly through the mud of Aunt Effie's cabbage patch toward the broken and twisted record. And there started history. So that's what we're here to celebrate today. Although the remarks about the 1929 launch and the fact that it brought all of the Worcester police and the ambulances and, and remarks from all over the country, that's what really made Goddard famous because um, in response to 1929, there were headlines in the St. Louis Dispatch, the Washington Post, the LA Times, the New York Times, and they're like, Roar heard two miles in moon rocket test. Man in moon scared green. But it is the history of, 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 of American rocketry and it's something we share in Worcester and Auburn and central Massachusetts, so it's great that we're here today to celebrate. Um, Goddard, responding to 1929, said, I tell you that there was no attempt to the reach the moon or anything like that, referring to the, the tests here. And they do continue here from 26 to 29. True enough, I did say back in 1920 that it might be possible to send a rocket to the moon someday, but such a thing won't happen for many years to come. So 50 years later, we celebrate it. The other 
great biography of Goddard that's, that's more recently published is, is by David Clary, who actually has Worcester roots. And on the back of the jacket, it's, it's James Lovell, who was the commander of Apollo 12, writes, every boy needs a hero. For me, it was Robert Goddard. From an early age, rockets fascinated me. I read Goddard's published texts, and in high school, I wanted to be a rocket engineer. When I joined the space program and worked with rockets, my dream was fulfilled. Robert Goddard was the visionary who laid the path for America's ventures into space. How appropriate that we celebrate him today, and how appropriate that we do it knowing that, that most of the media that we're seeing is celebrating someone else these days. A, a spacesuit made in, um, in New Jersey, or not mentioning much about Goddard. But you do have a weekend where you can find more about all the Worcester inventions. You can come to the Worcester Historical Museum and you can see the backup Snoopy cap through which Neil Armstrong might have had said if they'd used the backup, it's on loan from NASA, this is one small step for man, made by David Clark Company in Worcester. So keep in mind Goddard's most famous quote, it's difficult to say what is impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And with all of you and Lauren's leadership, we will make Goddard the reality of tomorrow and the hero of the American space program. So thank you for being here. And I think at this point, I turn it back to Lauren for our instructions about what we're doing next. Sure. Thank you. So we're just gonna get one picture of all the speakers and then um, uh, Charlie and Eric, if you could text the CMAS rocket team, uh, down below at the um, ninth pole, there is a monument where Goddard did the original launch, and uh, they are awaiting our call that we've finished up here, and they're going to begin to launch uh, some rockets. Just, yeah, just a world. I'm going to count down and then you're just going to push that forward. See this button here? You're just going to push it forward when we go fire. Okay. Now we have Lydia is going to do the launching. Okay. The Mercury Redstone in five, four, three, two, one. Push, push, push. Okay, I got that one. Can you point them away from the drones? I mean. <laughs> we have one successful recovery. Yeah. Recovery, that's the one you set up. Okay, what's your name? Grace. Grace? Okay, Grace is going to launch. So we're going from the old to the new. SpaceX. Falcon, Falcon 9. You have continuity? Okay. You can see that button there? You're just going to push it forward. Okay. We're going in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Nice one. 
I got it. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> okay, so, um, what's your name? Luke? Okay. Which one do you want to launch? The, the, the arrow, the rocket, or the big cat, or the other one? The big one? Or the, uh, what? The big one? Okay. Alright, so next up we have arrow, rocket, launch, rail, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna push that forward, right? When when we count to zero, when we go blast up, right? You're gonna go. You're gonna push it forward, okay? Got it? Okay. Okay, Luke, watching the arrow. Oh, hang on. feet. to be aware that it's going to be loud and Gio is launching the cool spool. Okay. Continuity. Yeah. So we're going to push this one forward. Okay, when we count down to zero. That one, yeah. Go through, yeah. Okay, cool spool. Everybody, heads up. We're going in five, four, three, two, one. One. Uh, that wasn't very high. We'll put another igniter. Don't, we'll we'll don't worry, Jill, we'll, we'll do it again. Okay, well, no, we're going to have to get another igniter. We'll put, we'll put it in. We're going to launch Nell next. Okay, who is launching now? One of you guys? You guys want to launch now? Or you you launch one yet? No? You haven't launched yet? Come on. We'll launch. You'll not launch now. Okay, Vincent launching the replica of Robert Goddard's Nell. Going in five, four, four three, three, two, one. Again. Woo! We're going in five, four, four three, three, two, two one. one. Push it. <laughs> Good job! <laughs> Yeah, that was so good. All right. 
So what so see this thing we're gonna push it forward. Okay, go well, down to zero and then continuity light goes on. Okay. So Cassidy, launching, what is it called? The latte. The latte. The latte. In five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Rory. All right, Rory. Okay, we're gonna uh, uh, what? Oh. And Rory's gonna be doing the one. Okay, so I see this thing here, we're just gonna push it forward, okay? Don't do it yet. Okay, Rory! Launching the streamer rocket in five, four, three,